we did collective learning, and so basically what we got was it was theories that were researched and improved by someone, and having it being like knowledge being passed down and other people building on it and kind of getting like adding their own information and sharing and improving the ideas of it. And so they explained it like a spider web sort of thing, like it kind of starts from something and then spreads out like in different ways because as different people add their own ideas to it. Yeah, and like it's kind of um, the goal of it is to combine ideas and to kind of synthesize a new concept or to improve upon um, a concept or object or idea that um, somebody came up with before. And we talked a lot about how this couldn't really be possible with the fact of human knowledge in that, uh, well not human knowledge, uh, human language in that the fact that we can talk about intangible objects and that we can put it in somebody else's mind and that um, people can all see and experience the same idea or concept and they can improve upon it themselves or together as a community or just as individuals. Can you give us an example of it? Think elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Step up, come on. Right. Okay, so what he means is like, I can put an image in your mind without you actually seeing it. So elephants aren't actually pink. I could show you an elephant and you know what an elephant is, but you'd actually, when I say pink elephant, you wouldn't know if you just saw it. You'd have to actually, with language, you can actually picture it in your mind. So in other words, we have knowledge of an elephant, mm -hmm. we have knowledge of pink. And we can bring those together. How does it look at Grapes of Wrath? How does collective learning look in Grapes of Wrath? What, what, are, what are some signs of it? <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas? Yesterday we were talking about the significance of objects and how it has to tie into memories and that really the idea of family and home and that people together have collectively created these memories and that they have create an image in their mind a family and that yeah family and how that has a permanency even in the fact that if you burn the objects or the family is taken apart like Tom was and he went to prison that it still exists and that you can recreate that as Tom did when he visited um, he revisited his family and there was a reunion that it was all the same as it was before and that people can collectively share a memory and create ones an image is a family yeah well, my example from Grapes of Wrath was that during the Dust Bowl, they had new technologies such as tractors, and then they learned that you can't overplant in some areas because you have dry soil, and it eventually causes Dust Bowl. So now we know that you have to terrace farm and grow trees and all that, which is collectively learning about what happened during the Dust Bowl. Well, what? Our eighth graders told us that claim testers are a lie because of the acronym a lie, in which you have authority, logic, intuition, and evidence, which my friend Burial will discuss. Okay. Well, <laughs> authority is like credibility, so that would be ethos. Boom. And then logic is like logos and like saying if it makes sense and stuff. And then intuition is if you feel it's right or the gut feeling. And then evidence is like fact. So in claims testing, what are you actually doing? You're giving, you're sort of verifying what you have as your claim or the point you're trying to make. For um, evidence? What's that? How does it apply to the Grapes of Wrath? Why are we going to use claims testing in Grapes of Wrath? <laughs> in an argument? Yes, in the paper you could look at your ally to... Um, claims testing is not just verifying something is true, but looking at something somebody is saying and verifying not that it's just that it's true, but if they're coming from evidence that is also true, and looking at the background of what they're saying. And that's why there's this acronym of the four different things, because you're looking at each part of their arguments rather than just the entire one. So you're looking at the research you've gathered for your topic, and you're, you're testing whether it's true or not, or viable. That was awesome, man. Okay, so everyone uses claim testers on a daily basis. So if someone... Um, 
comes up to me and says, like if we use the pink elephant example, I know logically that, uh, and from my background knowledge, that elephants aren't pink. <laughs> so I can say that their claim of that elephants are pink is wrong because I know that an elephant is actually gray from previous experience. But someone who has never seen an elephant might, th or might agree with their claim because their background knowledge doesn't um, have anything against it. So they're weighted differently, authority, logic, evidence, and intuition in someone's mind. They're weighted differently in everyone's mind. Um, so that's how we make, that's how we test the authenticity of a claim that someone's trying to tell you. Okay, so we learned about scale. Um, like it said, uh, scale is kind of like one of the obscure topics to learn about, but um, one of our interpretations of scale was like enlarging or minimizing like an idea to get either like a big picture or like specific ideas from it. Um, one of like kind of like a universal example was like let's look at Earth. Earth is like the third planet from the sun in the solar system. We look deeper into it, we get to see like the United States uh, of America that is, because we know that. Um, and then we see that there's 50 states. There's also Canada to the north of us, South America. We zoom in more, we see Wisconsin, uh, the dairy, the dairy state. Um, we zoom in more, we see Waukesha. Zoom in more, we can see like all the high schools in north, south, west, Gal Moraine, Arrowhead, McGuanico, all that. And then zoom in more, you get to see like all the different cities, all the different neighborhoods. And then so it's like you can go in as far in to get as specific of ideas as possible, or you can zoom out as much to get like the more broader, more general ideas. Wow. That was four thresholds of increasing complexity. So to start off, I'm going to let you know that there's going to be eight different ones that you're going to want to write down for your notes. So the first one is the um, Big Bang. Could someone write them on the board on the board? Okay. <laughs> Big Bang. Alright. And then the second one is called When Stars Light Up. Okay. And then three is New Chemical Elements. And number, number four, Earth and the Solar System. And then number five is Life. And then six is Collective Learning. Number seven is agriculture. Hold on, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> She's going. <laughs> and then um, agriculture. And eight is the modern revolution. And each of these lead up to the next. And they get um, they're made up of Goldilocks conditions, which is a new term for me. <laughs> and it's just like the perfect condition for or the perfect like um, condition for something to happen. And um, stop a second, guys. In our book, what was the Goldilocks condition? Can you really think of one? That's going to be I can't wait to hear Rob, did you look at the Is it the idea that things can be endlessly and that um, things are all affected by each other and that everything kind of happens for a reason? Is that kind of the idea behind um, the thresholds of an increasing complexity? Or is it more just... Does anything ever come to an end, or is it always being worked? Eighth graders. Out? Well, it does come to it does end in a way. Um, some of these continue on, like collective learning. Collective learning goes on even to today. But um, things such as the Big Bang. The Big Bang isn't happening today, as you know. Um, it stopped when new things happened, such as when the stars lit up. That was the uh, increasing complexity that happened with that because. More complex thing came along, and the least complex thing just kind of, I guess, died off in a way, almost like evolution is. So it's 
you can almost compare it to evolution. Yeah, and it. same thing. When new thresholds kind of start, when things are able to collectively construct into more things. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, guys? Did you get your question answered? How, how does this apply to what we're writing? Because if these stay the same for every, they, if they're always the same, how does this apply to each individual piece of writing separately? All right, we had approaches to knowledge. And what approaches to knowledge is, is taking this pr perspective of different types of people so you can understand the topic better. Like, um, for example, we had uh, something from their reading. It said, historians describe something as something like this, but like that's for taking it from a historian's perspective. But you could also take it from this perspective of a regular person, and the information might be different to you than to some expert of the topic. Um, do you guys have anything else? <laughs> So in simple terms, what does it mean? <laughs> it could be like how you personally view a certain topic. Okay. Yeah, perspectives. Hey, creators, anything for your part? Just in simple terms, what does it mean? I guess she kind of covered it. It's the perspective of whoever is, whoever's perspective it is. Like Mr. Jonas says to me, did you give an example? Can you give an example? Or you guys think about guns, germs, and steel? I guess it's like you're reading, I don't know anything about the book you're reading, but it's just like a nonfiction book or something. The perspective of the author, author is what they say in the book. So is this something that's subject to claims testing then? Or collective learning. Okay. We know the doctor option. Yeah, that connection. Somebody had a hand up over here. Yes. Well, it's just because everyone has a different background. Uh, they bring that new perspective to the thing. So it does, it does take claims testing because everyone has that different thing. They can check if it works with their background knowledge and then also collective learning definitely because they're all taking their different perspective on the one issue. So are we talking about a difference in let's say a scientific approach to our topic of farming as opposed to a historical approach to it yeah. as opposed to a literary approach to it? Is that what we're talking yeah. about? Bingo. Like in the Jared Diamond thing he used multiple sources like he used history, he used archaeology and whatever to support his claim so that makes it that's almost like evidence in the claim testers field but then he also put himself as an authority which causes you to believe whatever he says uh, it, with my sophomores is this making sense so different different expertise different genres different fields of study are brought to bear okay Tuesdays. okay so our topic was change over time relatively self-explanatory. There's like six different pillars. I don't know if that's what you guys call them, but it's origins, beginnings, growth, change, development, and modern day. So that just kind of takes you through like everything that you can go through pretty much. Uh, you can apply it to almost anything. Yeah. And we also talked about, we talked about how you use collective learning or collaboration. Okay. Guys, I think they're in our handout. Yes. Sam again, though. Sam again, so you can write them down. Okay, we have oranges. Eighth graders, if you have your iPads, get them out and take these notes down, because this is something that you can do. Is it in the book? Yeah, I'm No. Yes. Let's just note them, guys. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry, Nicole. Okay, so we have oranges, then beginnings. Are they the same thing? No. Not oranges. From what I understood, it, oranges is like everything that happened before whatever you're talking about leading okay. up to that thing, and then beginnings is the actual event gotcha. starting. Good. Okay. Um, and then you have growth, so that's just how it grows. Then you have change, so how it obviously begins to change over time. Then you have development. Then the last is modern day. So that takes you all the way through 
any history of any, you can pick an object, an idea, and it'll take you through the entire process. Thank you very much. Origin, beginning, growth, change, development, modern day. And is modern day speculative? Is it predicting what's going to happen, or is it just what's happening today? From what I understood, what's happening today. Gotcha. So there is no hy hypothesis, there is no speculation. That's the Ford. <laughs> okay. 